moving on from uh, to Venezuela to the the other major target of the U.S. state at the moment, and it's the the considerably larger and more dangerous you know situation that we find ourselves bearing down upon, and that is Iran. And again, it's very hard to figure out just how seriously to take all of this. I mean, I take it very seriously, but it does seem like right now the biggest impediment to us starting a war with Iran is Donald Trump and his genuine lack of interest or lack of patience. And just, I think for he genuinely actually doesn't want America to fight a war. He wants to look tough. He doesn't want to be humiliated. I could see him like, you know, caught doing airstrikes or whatever, but at the same time he put Mike Pompeo, his secretary of state and put John Bolton in charge of everything else. So you have this very weird thing where like the people, the, the, the people who are like, were too crazy almost even for the Bush administration now have their fingers on the trigger, but their boss is, t- is a guy who, who doesn't have any of the uh, drive or ideological fervor or commitment to regime change in Iran, which as we've talked about on the last episode we did with you, we've returned to this many times before is like the Holy grail for these neoconservative psychos. I think part of it is because, because Trump is so disengaged because he's, he is kind of apolitical in a sense. He has instincts and he has sadism that he likes to see, uh, uh, sated. And he has these hooting crowds of, of psychos that he loves to be happy to see him and to cheer him, but he doesn't have any kind of programmatic ideas. Uh, so that means that he doesn't have people on his side in any broad sense. He doesn't have a stable of wonks to carry out his will because he doesn't have a will. So instead, he's got the, the D.C. establishment, which just is this conveyor belt of people. And it's like, oh, you have a, an opening? Here's a guy. You know? And if you hang around long enough and you're a, a, a creep like Bolton or Compeo, you get to pop up. And then, but they have their own agendas that are tied to more broad uh, you know, neoconservative ideas. Trump has no interest in that. But he also has no interest in managing anything, in preventing them from doing what they want to do. And also, hilariously, even though he got famous on TV for saying you're fired, he hates firing people because he doesn't like personal confrontation because he has no personal virtues. That's the thing about Trump is that he has no virtues, like even even the virtues of an asshole, you know, like I, like I'll look a man in the eye and fire him. It's like, well, that makes you a prick, but at least you have the virtue of not feeling like you're too much of a coward to confront that moment. Like he has nothing. No, he has no positive virtues. So that means that these guys just do the things and they do them out of his purview. And then it comes to us and he's like, wait a minute, what were you doing? Like the, the, the bombing in Iran where they, they brought it to him on a platter. Let's do a limited strike on Iran. Fingers crossed that it was going to escalate something. And at the last minute, he's like, oh, this is actually uh, this is committing me to something that I do not have anything like the stamina or or uh, will to do so he pulled back and so but the thing is he won't fire them he won't get rid of them so they're gonna keep doing it they're gonna keep poking the fucking bear until something happens that forces Trump's hand which is why this situation is you know both surreal and terrifying and like I could easily imagine something unimaginable happening but again like I just have to use this as an example of people really are now who are now obsessed with Trump and there is like there is much that is evil and abominable about his administration, but I'm sorry, they're not even in the same galaxy as the first George W. Bush administration. Do you think that they would have let a chance to bomb Iran after some sort of ludicrous provocation, like that fucking oil tanker thing? Do you think that they would let that go to pot at all? Or I'm sorry, even a Hillary Clinton administration? Oh, well, Hillary would have been in there with both feet. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I think everybody knows that. And yeah, in a way, the the good thing about, as you were saying, the good thing about Trump being a total sleaze is that he has half an ear to uh, the pulse of the sleaze normal and what the sleaze normal values above all. I don't, I don't know if people fully realize this, but I do because I spend a lot of time on comment threads. What, <laughs> what they want is noise. What they want is not necessarily a bunch of body bags coming home. They want noise. And Trump supplies the noise, and so far without the body bags. And that makes a lot of people happy. Um, Obama, in his uh, quite creepy way, was an ideal counterinsurgency leader, to, if there can be such a thing, because there are doubts about the whole theory of counterinsurgency and whether it will ever really work, short of genocide. But 
Obama was as yeah another word for counterinsurgency yeah, actually yeah. <laughs> yeah but Obama was about as close as you can get a smiling brown face with experience of many different cultures who was at home in many different cultures and killed quietly no noise when it was required and it, when he thought he was in private would boast about what a good killer he was um, Trump doesn't have that kind of finesse and part of the reason the the hidden Wacko Norm hated, there are a lot of reasons they hated Obama. One of them was he didn't bark enough. He didn't make enough noise for them. And uh, the fact that he actually killed those the security state thought needed killing was by no means enough recompense for them because they literally wanted the noise. And Trump so far has figured out a way to supply some of the noise without some of the killing. Um, the question is how long he can do that because, as you said, this creates a very unstable uh, situation. And you don't really want an unstable situation with Iran. But then I, I don't know how to talk to people in America about this. Um, the headlines say, Iran just broke the agreement. <laughs> you mean the one that we <laughs> purposely reneged on after it was carefully? Yeah. You can't break an agreement that you loudly and publicly reneged on no uh, john i mean like I, i've been reading a lot of the you know the the angry american commentariat where they were like iran was in violation of this deal even before they signed the deal and it's like a very philip k dick thing going on here it's like now wait until last year or something like that like but it does seem like you know uh, whether you're the american enterprise institute or brookings you know that that's, that's our array range, of yeah. that's our range of <laughs> options here uh they just, they, for them, Iran is will always be the bad guy because, as we talked about in the last episode we were on, Iran's a bad guy because they won their revolution and they still have their country and they've bloodied our nose terribly many times since then, perhaps most recently in the war in Iraq, which they yeah. won. Yeah, Iran is a clear winner of, <laughs> like, of the war in Iraq. Um, and, the, and the 2006 invasion of Lebanon. The yeah, Israeli invasion yeah, Lebanon. yeah, they're... Their so-called proxies are, are on a big, big winning streak. It isn't a winning streak that directly affects the United States, except to the extent that the U.S. insists on identified with two losing causes, Israel and Saudi Arabia. But that's, the U.S. does insist on identifying with those losing causes to uh, an insane extent. So, yeah, the, they have to be punished in some way, except of all the countries in the world, Iran is one of the hardest to punish. I mean, what are you going to do to them? I mean, they're, they're like, you know, De Niro at, at the end of that fight with the three guys in Cape Fear. Like, <laughs> he, he's been, I can out philosophize <laughs> you, <laughs> counselor. It's going to take a hell of a lot more than that, counselor, to prove you're better than me. I, yeah. I thought you were going to say De Niro at the end of Raging Bullet. Well, that would knock me down, Ray. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Ray didn't knock him down. Yeah. I mean, the U.S. was supplying, uh, I, I, I'm sure most people know the basics of the Iran Iraq War of the 1980s, but it lasted. I, I, you'd be surprised. But yeah. <laughs> Lasted from 1980 when Iran was at its lowest point in many decades, when the Shah had been deposed, when half the officer corps had been executed and the other half was languishing in prison, when uh, everyone assumed the Islamist regime that is now the IRI would be a short-term uh, bunch of hicks who would be replaced by the, the cosmopolitans. Instead, the cosmopolitans went to prison or the firing squads. Um, even the Iranian uh, Communist Party, the Tudeh, saw in their rather excessively linear way, they saw Khomeini as a step to an end to the inevitable proletarian revolution. Well, that didn't happen. And the U.S. Uh, took its revenge via Saddam, who was sort of a friend at the time, and shared satellite information with the Iraqi command, shared weapons with the Iraqi command, and gave it every encouragement to go invade this paralyzed, helpless Iraq. We could go through a long history of the war, but cut to eight years later, Saddam is begging for peace. Uh, the Iranian army is now on Iraqi soil in some places. The Iraqi invading army, with all that American satellite help, with all that Soviet training and all that armor-heavy advancing tanks, forces, yeah. uh, penetrated a few miles into Iraq. The expected minority ethnic uprisings did not occur and 
the attack never got anywhere near the northeastern plateau where the majority of the ethnic Iranian population resides. It was a complete disaster and left the Iraqis terrified. I talked to an Iranian veteran of the war about what it was like on the front lines, and he just laughed and said, they were terrified of us. Um, and when you have a side that is willing to do human wave attacks to clear minefields uh, and then has troops in reserve to cross the minefields once they've been cleared, you have reason to be terrified. Uh, so Iran is basically not invadable. The, the idea of an invasion of Iraq is bullshit. The idea of a, a war between Iran and Saudi Arabia is even bigger nonsense. Saudi Arabia is as fragile as a moon colony. And so <laughs> are the uh, Gulf states on the eastern side of what Iranians call the Persian Gulf, what Arabs prefer to call the Arab Gulf, let's just call it the Gulf. Those countries are uh, destroyable with surface to surface missiles, and those happen to be the weapons in which the Iranian military excels most of all. And they also happen to be the weapons which the U.S. military, which has invested heavily in uh, human piloted fighters, aircraft carriers, and other gold plated weapons, does not want to think about. Uh, the U.S. Navy has no plan for a swarm of surface-to-surface anti-ship missiles, except one of these days we will have lasers that work. They have been saying that <laughs> since I was a hardware nerd, and, and that means... What about, what about the rail gun? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the rail gun? The, hey, it killed that giant transformer in, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. in uh, Dark yeah. of the Moon. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there, there's the rail gun. Uh, it used to be a bad guy when Saddam was going to get it, and 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 then Mossad killed everybody who was involved in that project, and and now it's now it's going to get us out of trouble. But even a railgun re- needs reloading, and surface to surface missiles are cheap and easy to make. And when you're dealing with the gigantic targets that Iran has to face, you don't need to aim that perfectly. What you need is numbers, because the U.S. has designed. Weapons which can't be dismissed as bad, but are meant for an imaginary Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union in which manned or sorry, human piloted planes would be the main aerial weapon. That means that the Patriot missile is a good weapon if you want to use its fragmentation warhead to bring down an incredibly fragile Soviet fighter bomber jet because those things are unbelievably easy to kill a scud is not easy to kill it's not even guided it's your eighth grade geometry problem um it you fire it at an arc with x amount of fuel and you can predict within a very broad range where it's going to land and if you're aiming say at a, a saudi port on the gulf which contains some of the most fragile technology in the world oil refineries, basically tubes full of explosive liquids, desalination plants, tubes full of the water that keeps the hugely overpopulated Arabian Peninsula alive and which would soon uh, die of thirst without them. You don't need a super accurate scud. And if the U.S. has a total inventory of 10,000 Patriot missile, if everyone hit its target in a mass surface-to-surface attack, on the east coast of Saudi Arabia, which, by the way, is Shia and not too thrilled about being under Saudi Arabia in the first place. They might hit their targets, some of them, because some have been designed comically enough with a revised warhead, which is now just, and I kid you not, a gigantic cylinder of lead. Because the idea is these little fragmentation warheads just don't do anything to a scud. It's like the scud comes up in its little parabola, fragmentation warhead goes off, Scud goes, oh, uh, I think something, some mosquito just hit me. So, so it's like a fist that'll just punch it yes, out of the air. Yeah, and, or at least deflect its course. I mean, yeah, think how hard a physics problem that is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and how easy a physics problem it is to design a new model Scud. And, and Iran has been designing bigger and better and longer range, uh, some guided, some unguided, surface-to-surface missiles uh, for decades, getting some of the technology through... Uh, North Korea, some through uh, God knows Ukraine. There was a time when you could buy anything in Ukraine and the Soviet Union. Um, the CIA bought most of it, but I really doubt they bought all of it. And uh, all you have to do is create a sufficient number 
that you can overwhelm these Patriot batteries because it takes a while to reload a Patriot. Um, it usually carries groups of four missiles to reload, and you cannot say, wait, hold on, we're reloading. This, you know, this is not a war that has to be fought fair. So the idea of even fighting a proxy war on behalf of Saudi Arabia against Iran is a lie. It's, being a lie. it's a lie that's being peddled to a lot of people. The idea of an invasion of Iran is more than a lie. It's a joke. They should get some of those S-400s. I hear those are much better than the <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah they're, they're, they're bigger, I think. I, I, I think you, what you need in a coming war is quantity because the coming war, quantity and variety, because the coming war, and this is something the U.S. has been as slow to realize as the Spanish tercios were to realize before the Battle of Raqqa, uh, disillusioned them in a hurry. Uh, when you have a successful technology, and since 1945 we've had a, what seems to be a sufficient, successful technological mix, there's a huge interest in not disturbing it. But what do you do about drones, for example? Uh, drones are already in use by people with very low technical levels. The Houthis drones. got a bunch of drones, right? Yeah, the Houthis have drones, Islamic State had drones. All you need is a little drone to go over the target and you wave down to them and flip a switch which releases a catch, which releases a grenade and uh, you have the world's cheapest air force. We are not used to that. We are used to having complete air superiority. So to shoot down drones, you need a mass of tiny little you know, hornet size. A giant butterfly net. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, oh, a net might work too, but you need a whole bunch of new technology to shoot down giant parabolic regional missiles. You need much bigger weapons. So, John, I mean, like, obviously, the people whose job it is to know this shit at like the Pentagon or at think tanks or whatever, they're certainly, they can't be unaware of this. There must be people who realize like you said, that the idea of the United States going to war with Iran is a joke. It would destroy our military. And like, this is a war we would lose and lose badly, despite how powerful, you know, despite all the money and the technology that we have. Like, again, the, the average American soldier, think about that, what, invading Iran? So what's he can get, a, as Felix likes to say, get a communications degree back in America? Like... What, like they really want to die for this? I mean, or like it was bad enough in Iraq when they just became like the cops of Baghdad, basically getting picked off by IEDs and taking it out on the local population. I mean, Iran is like a hundred times worse than that. Yeah. Iran like, is di designed as a fortress. I mean, mountain ranges surrounding a central plateau where the most important population lives. How do you even get to Tehran? I mean, remember, the U.S. has tried to get to Tehran. That was way back during the Carter years when they were... The U.S. military had a slight infatuation with other militaries, Soviet and Israeli at once. So they wanted to do a, an Israeli-style Entebbe raid to free the hostages in Tehran. They didn't get anywhere near Tehran. And these were the best of the best. Uh, it's it's ridiculous. So they must know that, but at the same time, like I said, at the you know highest echelons of like you know Amer the American foreign policy wonks and think tanks, this is like the, like I said, the holy grail for them. They they still have this idea that we're going to do regime change in Iran, and it's just like, is it insanity or is it a bluff? Like what what accounts for this? Because these people keep talking about how you know. Look, I, I I've actually noticed now that like. Even they are kind of aware of the idea that they are not going to sell the American people on another wholesale land invasion of a country like Iran after they blew it all in Iraq. So they, but they keep saying things like, we need to get tough with Iran, or there needs to be an, a response. Or we have to show toughness because if, you know, we're, you know, if we don't respond, then you know, uh, weakness will invite more aggression from the Iranians or whatever. It's just like... Is it is it just insanity or is it just bluster or or like what like what are these people after? I mean that's a really good question. And on our show on Radio Warner, I frequently get hung up on questions of consciousness, as in what are they actually thinking? Um, and I don't know what they're actually thinking because there aren't a lot of rational thoughts in range here. the The point is, you could do a lot of damage to Iran. There's no doubt about that. The U.S. Uh, can do a, a lot of harm. The U.S., if it wanted to, could annihilate a, 
Iranian cities if it was willing to break the nuclear taboo. And there were suggestions during the hostage crisis in 1979 uh, that it do so. Uh, so far, the taboo has held. So it's unlikely that uh, the U.S. would nuke an Iranian city. But if it did, um, it could certainly do that kind of harm. It could destroy the Iranian petroleum industry with uh, cruise missile or airstrikes. If it used airstrikes, it would lose airplanes, there would be prisoners of war, it would look really ugly. But that's as far as I can go. It could do a lot of harm. But what people who think about that don't factor in very well is Iran, with its allies, especially Hezbollah, is the best in the world at doing counter-harm by means that you do not expect and in places you do not expect. For example, Hezbollah has shown an ability to strike throughout Europe, throughout the Middle East. Hezbollah is extremely good at assassination. I don't want to end up over-idealizing these groups. Hezbollah kills people. It it does a very good job of killing people. It tends to kill the right people, (laughs) which is harder than most people realize. Uh, Assassination is not as easy as the movies make it look. Um, But if the U.S. hurt Iran Iran would hurt the U.S. back, and not necessarily in the Persian Gulf. I've seen a defense research study which says, what's our first move in a war with Iran? And basically, when you get out of the euphemisms, it says, evacuate everybody from the Persian Gulf. Mm. So Iran seems to be thinking, yeah, the U.S. is going to have sense enough maybe to do that. So where have we seen these tanker attacks And this is where I differ from the majority of, uh, say, left analysts on this uh, who would say these are Gulf of Tonkin provocations uh, all over again. They may well be that. The U.S. is certainly capable of staging something that dumb. But when you look at the locations, remember, they're all outside the Persian Gulf. Um, There's a little enclave of the UAE called Fujairah, uh, which is on the Indian Ocean, the open Indian Ocean. And the UAE, cleverly thinking Iran can cut off the Strait of Hormuz due north of this enclave and thereby close the Gulf, built a pipeline between its territory and this enclave of Fujairah on the Indian Ocean. And the, the thinking was obvious. This way, the Iranians can't get us. We bypass their choke point at the Strait of Hormuz. So a few weeks ago, Somebody very carefully, without sinking a ship, without hurting a single human being, disabled three of those tankers in port in Fujairah. The U.S., of course, refused to get the message or get any message. A bit later, somebody disabled two tankers on the open ocean, in the Indian Ocean, far outside of Fujairah. Uh, At first they said those uh, tankers were torpedoed and everybody laughed because a torpedo impact can be noticed instantly. It's meant to break the ship in half and sink it. This, on the contrary, hit the ship from the top and set it on fire, and the captain of one of the ships said, we were hit from the sky by something that dropped an explosive, like, say, a drone. Mm. Uh, So that seems to me to be, okay, maybe it was Gulf of Tonkin, I don't know, but it could just as easily be a smart and extremely restrained way of saying, you guys are not thinking clearly. <laughs> You're not thinking what we could do. And I'm, I'm one of the, you know, supposed Iranian provocations is they shot down a, a U.S. drone. Yeah. And that was one of my favorite things because it was like, they shot down our drone. That drone was two weeks from retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Francis Gary Power Corp. <laughs> Millions of circuits died. <laughs> they were dreaming their Danny Glover lives, <laughs> showing Mel Gibson the pictures of their boats when they retired. <laughs> And all of a sudden, they died. Yeah, and the, the other amazing thing about that drone, $222 million. Hilarious. I, I, I Hilarious. Mean, I, always, I always thought the drones would have a trouble com- competing with a piece of crap like the F-35 <laughs> because you get four F-35s for the billion dollars if you're lucky, and it's probably going to go higher. And I thought, the problem with drones is that they're cheap. Well, they fixed that one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the kind of Pentagon contracting, yeah. No, again... Um, why can't we have universal health care in this country? It's just too much money. <laughs> Who's going to pay for it? Be realistic, people. 
We could have had fucking universal health care and college debt forgiveness for like the F-35 program, basically. Oh, yeah. oh God, yes. <laughs> or something approaching that. The flying guillotine. Instead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And some of those kids might actually have been effective workers, unlike the F-35. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, newsflash to uh, any Chapa listener. Uh, war, any kind of war or provocation with Iran, extremely bad. <laughs> <laughs> extremely bad do not want uh just or or the idea that uh i mean did you see the great this clip of bernie sanders on face the nation where the woman was like talking about well trump uh you know he he decided not to do a strike and he was like oh well you know he he set the we set it on fire in the first place then he puts it out and then she was like well, you know, it was a limited strike. And he just goes, oh, well, excuse me. I, didn't, I just didn't know you could drop bombs on a nation of people. And that's an act of warfare. Yeah. So this well, idea that, that there's any way that, like you said, like it will be, you know, we're talking to them. And, and any, any, any response that we make, the idea that we'll do some limited airstrike to them and it'll, it'll end there or that'll bring them to the negotiating table or something is insanity. Well, it's it's a, insanity. It, all of this is predicated, I'd say, among the media class, people like that, and even in um, with some of these people in government, is the idea that the U.S. It's these the relationship is is that we act upon these countries, right. we exactly. act upon them. They yeah. cannot act in response. Yes. There's nothing that they can do. They don't have internal politics. They don't have their own agenda yes. and strategies. And there's nothing that they can do in response to what we do. Exactly. And I think in Iran. It's important to know a little history here. Um, for intelligence gathering and uh, irregular warfare purposes, you can consider Iran and Hezbollah as very closely linked. Iran and Hezbollah, as an Iranian said, there's real love there. There's, there's real affection there. And, and uh, as this Iranian woman said, that's what the U.S. doesn't understand. This is not bought allegiance. This is an allegiance that goes way back to when Iran helped us, when the Shia of southern Lebanon were the poorest and the most despised of every group in the country. So when you think about what they can do, it's worth remembering the attempt to put 240, well, 200, 300 Marines in a high rise outside Beirut. Mm. 242 of them were dead within seconds of a truck bomb attack. Uh, the next encounter between American intelligence and Iran slash Hezbollah was the kidnapping, torture, extraction of all possible information, and eventual murder of the CIA station chief <laughs> in Beirut. And then the uh, VBIED, uh, that is car bomb attack, on the CIA headquarters in Beirut at the time it was having its overall Middle East meeting where anybody who was anybody in the CIA uh, was in the room and died. I mean, this, this is not just a mixed result. This is annihilation. And there's no reason to suppose it would go any better now because Iran is the winner of the Iraq war. Qasim Soleimani is going to be remembered as the hero and the victor of the Iran-Iraq war. The United States spent billions and trillions, probably three trillion dollars, uh, and 5,000 lives of its own, let alone how many, God knows, hundreds of thousands of Iraqi lives, um, imposing a Shia-led government on Iraq, which is by no means an Iranian puppet, but is largely friendly to Iran. So the situation is infinitely worse as far as a U.S.-Iran confrontation uh, is now than it was back in the 1980s. And in the 1980s, just to remind everybody quickly, they kicked our ass. There you go. I mean, uh, Eli Lake, are you listening? <laughs> he's uh, composing more battle raps. <sighs> um, yeah, he's going to diss uh, the IO2. 